Hello, good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this first Tuesday Scholar event of the new season. Before I begin with the introduction of our speaker, Jack Zipes, for today, I want to apologize. Uh, we are having, we had, and are, are continuing to have last minute difficulty with our registration software. That means that those of you who signed up for this uh, series through the library, um, especially if you signed up today, there you may have had some problems joining this uh, meeting. And I apologize for that. We are working on that situation right now because we don't want anybody to miss uh, our first speaker, Professor Jack Zipes, who is going to speak on the topic where fairy tales meet history. Professor Jack Zipes is Professor Emeritus of German Comparative Literature and Cultural Studies at the University of Minnesota. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. And now I would like to turn things over to our speaker, Jack Zipes on the topic where fairy tales meet history. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judy. Uh, I appreciate uh, your inviting me. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will have a lot of questions after I, I give my talk. Um, uh, I'm, the title of my talk today is Speaking the Truth with Fairy Tales, the historical power of the powerless. Uh, it may seem to many people, many of you, that we are living in some kind of exceptional time of conflict or that times of conflict are exceptional. However, in my opinion, the history of the origins of the human species demonstrates that wars and conflicts have been omnipresent in all societies throughout the world all the time. We have never known a time without conflicts. The causes have been diverse and include territorial, religious, and commercial disputes, as well as the ruthless pursuit of power by privileged elite groups that leads to the domination of masses of people. Just as important to my mind are the daily conflicts in common people's lives that stem from the exploitation of children and women, slavery, racial discrimination, the commercialization of established religions, the privatization of education and social class struggle. There is not a single conflict as, uh, or a single nation, I'm sorry, a single nation state in modern history that has brought about an iota of social justice without incessant personal and public conflict. Today, the rise of the fascist Donald Trump and his numerous cohorts appear to have caused incredible conflicts, but I believe it will not help us to think of the present period as exceptional or even particular. The rise of Trumpism is not unusual. It is a result of the daily systematic degradation of democracy in America that cannot be thwarted by the so-called oppositional pathetic political parties that are also responsible for the degradation. Does this mean that we should stop thinking with stories to confront the present conflicts and the oppression of tyrants? Of course not. But it does mean that we must first begin thinking out of the box, from the margins, so to speak not about reforming a corroded and corrupt political system, but 
about the potential of real genuine defiance that might contribute to the alternative ways of relating to one another with dignity and compassion, with compassion that reflects a truthful and high regard for humanity and also for history. It simply means in the particular case of folk and fairy tales that we must read to find truths and set and act upon them even though we may be and especially because we are powerless. In October of 1978, the courageous Czech nonconformist playwright philosopher and politician Vaclav Havel wrote a long prof profound essay titled The Power of the Powerless, in which he analyzed the conflictual conditions of post-totalitarian and post-democratic systems that do not serve the preservation of humanity. His purpose was to examine carefully the nature of power in diverse situations in which powerless people operate and to grasp whether and how these people might bring down despots and prevent the manipulation of the majority of powerless people in, in the Eastern European countries. Although Havel wrote his essay to address particular problems in Czechoslovakia at the time, at that time, he also discussed how dictatorships functioned in the entire Soviet bloc and threatened to spread and endanger Western democracies. Hence the significance of his essay today. Born in 1936 and raised in a country that knew only major conflicts throughout his life, a dissident who became the first democratically elected president of Czechoslovakia after 1989. Havel had felt the torment of oppression in prison and in his daily activities in the theater and also in several odd jobs imposed upon him. And so in short, his words emanated from his flesh and blood struggles. It would take too long to summarize the major points of Havel's dense essay. And we must bear in mind that it was written 1978 to critique a new kind of totalitarianism in Czechoslovakia and other Soviet bloc countries. There are some remarks, so there, there are remarks by Havel that I want to cite because they have a direct bearing on how contemporary Western political systems historically, historically operate under a facade of democracy, especially in the disunited States of America. For instance, his description of the post-totalitarian society has a striking resemblance to the military industrial complex in America and especially to the corporations that form a network of control and manipulation. So let us think about this with Hoffa. Between the aims of the post-totalitarian system and the aims of life, there is a yawning abyss while life in its essence moves toward plurality, diversity, independent self-constitution and self-organization. In short, toward the fulfillment of its own freedom, the post-totalitarian system demands conformity, uniformity and discipline. While life ever strives to create new and improbable structures, the post-totalitarian system contrives to force life 
into its most probable states. The aims of the system reveal its most essential characteristic to be introversion, a movement toward being ever more completely and unreservedly itself, which means that the radius of its influence is continually widening as well. This system serves people only to the extent necessary to ensure that people will serve it anything beyond this, that is to say, anything which leads people to overstep their predetermined roles as regarded by the system as an attack upon itself. We live today in America and other Western democracies to serve systems, even if it may seem that we are autonomous and free to make choices. We are not fully aware of how intricate the web of compliance is woven and has increased in the past 50 years due to the massive increase of sophisticated technology. We are in a case, we are in a, a case in which that technology masks the contradictions of the socio-political system and the culture industry. Much of the operations of the autocratic system has been described by David Singe Grewal in his book, Network Power, The Social Democracy, Social, I'm sorry, Dynamics of Globalization and in a series, excuse me, in a series of books about the liquid society by the Polish sociologist, Zygmunt Bauman. It's not necessary to label the American political system totalitarian, post-totalitarian, or walked democratic. What is important is to use history to discover the cracks and leaks in the culture industry and the political network to live a life in truth and to know truth and to know truth. It is crucial to see through and expose the society of the spectacle, which is what Havel calls a world of appearances, a mere ritual, a formalized language of semantic contact with reality and transformed into a system of ritual signs that replace reality with pseudo-reality. To a certain extent, we are all complicit with the present socioeconomic system in which we live as long as we serve it without questioning it. If we do not do this, Hava maintains, we live life as a lie. Yet there is a prevailing hope in all people that there can be authentic change for better living circumstances. As I, as Havel once again it states, I'm quoting him, living within the truth as humanity's revolt against an enforced position is on the contrary an attempt to regain control over one's own sense of responsibility. In other words, it is clearly a moral act, not only because we must pay so dearly for it, but principally because it is not self-serving, the risk may bring rewards in the form of a general amelioration in the situation, or it may not, end of a quote. Living in the truth, speaking the truth, and thinking with the truth can take various and diverse forms for everyone, depending on the context. There is no prescription or formula for discovering and feeling the truth. However, one factor remains stable and reflects its moral dimension. Truth relies on contesting the lies and deception of people in power, whether they are in a post-totalitarian or 
a post-democratic society. In particular, living in the truth means understanding that there can be no such thing as neutral or benign tolerance in the present form that it takes in America and elsewhere. Words make a difference in our lives. And words that form stories make even a greater difference as we struggle to live lives in truth. This struggle is incessant, must be incessant, because we are constantly faced with master narratives that cloud our vision of what it means to live in truth. What then is our responsibility as researchers, teachers, and just workers. Let me turn once again to a thinker of the past to answer my question to another neglected pursuer of truth, Karl Kruber, the brother actually of Ursula Le Guin, who wrote a significant study in 1992 with the title Retelling, Rereading the Fate of Storytelling in Modern Time. It seems to me that his words are extremely relevant today. And I want to uh, quote one, one little passage. All significant narratives are retold and are meant to be retold, even though every retelling is a making a new. Story can thus preserve ideas, beliefs, and convictions without permitting them to harden into abstract dogma. Narrative allows us to test our ethical principles in our imaginations where we can engage them in the uncertainties and confusion of contingent circumstance. It is not surprising therefore that narrative should be of, spe of special concern to us as we approach the end of the 20th century for the accelerated rationalizing and technologizing of our life has unmistakably increased the difficulty of storytelling and also the difficulty of understanding what could have made stories so important to so many other societies. For Kruber, storytelling is a social transaction between teller and listener, writer and reader, who engage in a quest to understand and modify received wisdom and provisional, prov provisional truths. Stories from the past are invaluable because they are at odds with the way we live and enable us to draw comparisons that have a bearing on how we live our lives in truth. In fact, they can be enlightening and speak truths that spark the hope and latent potential in all of us to live lives in truth. So here, I'd like to consider how our fondness for fairy tales, their popularity in all social classes stems from their profound truths that can be glimpsed from the diverse human conflicts depicted in the narratives and the insistence on social justice. They attract us, these tales attract us because they contain what we lack, characters who struggle and demand to live in truth. In many ways, fairy tales with their metaphorical allusions are more truthful than so-called realistic stories or novels and so on, because they are generally endowed with a sense of social justice that we do not find in our societies or in realism. While many folk and fairy tales admittedly reinforce patriarchal views about the world and the theme of might makes right, 
They tend to sympathize with victims and underdogs and women and are replete with compassion and justice that were not evident in the societies in which they were told and written. What makes fairy tales so valid and authentic if they have not been dumbed down for children is generally speaking the fact that they combine voices of peasants and lower class storytellers with the perspectives of educated upper class storytellers and writers. The formation of the genre fairy tale is predicated on the collusion and cooperation of people from social classes, genders, different social classes, genders, and backgrounds, and the retelling and rewriting of tales that are ageless and relevant to people's lives. In my own work, almost from the very beginning of my research 100 years ago, I developed a strong predisposition to discover and preserve the works of neglected writers and storytellers who have sought to pierce the illusions created by the reigning forces of culture in their respective countries. To my mind, these writers and storytellers have offered alternative ways of thinking with fairy tales that have excited me and given me the courage to try to live and work in truth. In my opinion, to move forward in history, we must move back in history and grasp why there are gaps and holes in our evolution and social sy systems. And we must ask how tales of the people, das Volk, might bring us hope and strategies to deal with the lies and liars of the present. In my own case, and in my own old age, I have decided to live and work with the motto to unbury dead authors and artists of fairy tales and fantasy from 1900 to 1950 before I myself am buried. Strangely, this has led me to become the lively publisher of a tiny press called Little Mo and Honey Bear, which does the excavating. This hopeful step in the culmination of my historical research that began in 1961 at Columbia University and has led me in the past 20 years or more to discover important fault lines in our historical knowledge and awareness. Since I have always been a library nerd, a used book pack rat, and a flea market junkie, it has not been difficult for me to sniff out numerous neglected authors and their works, both for adults and for young readers. In the course of 10 years, I've been fortunate to find amazing collections of fairy tales for my Princeton, Princeton University Press, oddly modern fairy tale series. But I didn't realize, I didn't realize that there were many more for young and old readers written by well-known and not so well-known authors and illustrators. And let me read off a list of just fantastic authors and artists whom most of you probably won't know, like Ethel Carney, Paul Vaillant Couturier, Dorothy Burroughs, Emery Kellen, Christian Behrman, R.A. Brandt, Maurice Drouin, Haywood Brown, Norbert Lebermann, Lisa Tetzner, Bertha Lask, Herminia Tormüllen, Frederick Lecroix, Jacques Prévert, Giovannino Guarchi, Naomi Mitchison and Johnny Rodari. It's interesting that we don't know these amazing figures in Western culture. Most of their tales are in the public domain and have been ignored for all sorts of reasons, politically too radical, much too experimental, very provocative and so on. 
yet it's clear that their unique stories and images have challenged the established ideologies in every society in the world, and that they have been uncomfortable for publishers to reprint after publication. The excellent publisher Golans in London sought at one point to develop a series of radical children's literature in the 1930s, but failed because of the anti-socialist forces and the rise of fascism. Nevertheless, there were many successes in many different countries from 1900 to 1950. As Kimberly Reynolds notes in her superb book, Left Out, The Forgotten Tradition of Radical Publishing for Children in Britain, 1910 to 1949, I quote from her book, social transformation is not simply a matter of desire and legislation. It requires new visions, which themselves depend on new forms of knowledge and new ways of seeing the world. Radical children's literature drew on the latest ideas from the spheres of science, politics, economics, pedagogy, social policy, literature, and the fine and applied arts to encourage readers to look with fresh eyes at how people were living, interacting and organizing themselves. It offered readers a vision, the children and young people who would inhabit in the world and who were at the center of efforts to reform and regenerate society. Indeed, the 20th century was to be the century of the child. It was not only in the United Kingdom, however, that progressive and provocative children's literature asserted itself at the beginning of the 20th century, but also in Germany, France, Russia, and many other European countries as well as North America. Hope filled the pages of the published books. And I believe that it is an important time to bring back the hope to address many of the same social and economic con conditions and political conflicts that are facing young people today. Consequently, in contrast to the series that I developed at Princeton, at Princeton University Press, that was focused more on adult readers. I began in 2019 to edit and publish a series of forgotten unique books, largely fairy tale collections, fantasy novels, more focused on young readers. This is the small publishing house, Little Mole and Honey Bear. I also wanted to retain the original illustrations in the books, which are unique and often involve great artists like George Gross and many expressionist artists. And these books deserve to be rediscovered because they speak truth to our times. The new series is titled Forgotten Fabulous Fairy Tales, Political Fairy Tales for Young and Old, and intends to bring tales and books back to life through storytellers. The series includes works that will shake our memories and provide great pleasure because of their unusual styles and con contents. Almost all the books are in the public domain. Many have been translated and published in English. I myself can translate uh, tales and books from German, French, and Italian, which have been translated some of which have not been translated before and are now, now I have translated, such as Paul Vaillant Couturier's Jean Santin, or I call it Johnny Breadless. In addition, most of the books have unique illustrations. At the end of each book, there are short afterwards, which focus on the author and socio-historical context of the book. Some of the books included in the series are, for instance, Christian 
Bermans, uh, <coughs> Christian Bermans, the Riese Ole and Hannah Lisa, the giant Ole and Tiny Tim, which was published in 1921. Virtually no one in Germany or the world today knows anything about Christian Behrmann. His dates are 1881 to 1924. And unfortunately, he died at a young age at 43. And that may contribute to the fact that he is has been forgotten. His best work is The Giant O and Tiny Tim. And I want to summarize it for you. Once upon a time, there could be, that could be any time, a lonely, humongous giant named O, and don't ask me why he was named O, was so lonely living in solitude on top of a mountain that he decided to seek friendship in a town called Haida, way down below. However, once this enormous giant appeared, he horrified the people who closed their doors and basically made it clear, made it clear that he was not wanted. No immigrants here, they shouted, get out of here. Poor old, the refugee, the immigrant, who would not harm a flea, left the town of Haida in despair and spent the night in a wheat field far from the town. In the morning, however, a young boy named Tiny Tim, and don't ask me why he was named Tiny Tim, stood over him and yelled that he was damaging the wheat and scaring all the animals. Well, despite the fact that Tiny Tim was only 10 years old, he was fearless and ordered the humongous giant to leave his farm immediately. But to his surprise, Ole begged him to let him stay. He promised that he would help in the fields and do any kind of work to keep the farm in shape. He would even renovate the barn and feed all the animals. So since Tiny Tim had lost his parents and had to look after his younger brother and sister, he accepted. And in the next months, Ole cleaned up the farm and fields and made friends with all the children in the region. Sometimes he would even carry them to a river, about 30 or 40 of them, and they would all go swimming. Ole was as tall and wide as an oak tree, and he often made himself into a kind of boat by floating on his back with the children, running all over him from head to foot. What a boat he was. Soon, however, the town of Haida was attacked by three nasty troublemakers from the underworld. They were slimy, dumb monsters, and the only thing they knew was to trump about and loot towns. The townspeople were horrified by these sinister creatures. So the townspeople, who still feared a hole, had to turn to him and Tiny Tim for help. And sure enough, the boy and the giant outsmarted the troublemakers and made them pay for all the destruction, all the destruction they had caused by making them work and cleaning the water on Tiny Tim's farm. Then Ole and Tiny Tim got rid of the vermin by sending them back down a hole to the underworld. Immediately thereafter, Ole and Tiny Tim became the heroes in the entire region. Yet as we know, life on earth is unpredictable and all of a sudden, joy turned to grief in the town of Haida. An ugly virus arrived. Indeed, death himself, a giant, wretched giant, appeared and started poisoning everyone. It seemed that nobody would survive the epidemic. However, once death announced that he was going to infect Tiny Tim. The giant Ole could not bear to allow this to happen. After all, 
Tiny Tim was a true friend. The townspeople had accepted him into their community. Everyone loved him, and indeed the giant loved them and Tiny Tim most of all. So he challenged death to a battle. Whoever would win would decide, would decide Tiny Tim's fate as well as the fate of the town. Well, this battle raged for one whole week, and in the end, death was squashed and, how to prom and had to promise to all he would retreat and not touch the hair of any single person in the town. Well, you can imagine what happened in the town of Haida. You can imagine the celebration in this small town named Haida. And don't ask me why the town was called Haida. I want to show you uh, some illustrations, if you can see it. That is uh, the giant old book. And here is the giant old carrying the vermin down. And here he is about to fight the giant, the, the death. And here is a celebration after he conquers death. So you can see the, these are really amazing paintings that, that uh, Behrman, Behrman was really phenomenal as a, uh, as an artist. I mean, his paintings were just as good as his writings. And I'd like to now just also talk a little about Paul Vaillant Couturier, whose book I translated, Jean Sampin, uh, Johnny Breadless, which came out in 1921. This book includes the original, at the beginning, the first version is in English, and then I kept the French in as a uh, sort of appendix. And here is an account of Paul Vaillant Couturier's war against war. During World War I, and some of you may recall this, not that you were there. During World War I at Christmas time in 1914, there was a, a sudden out widespread unofficial ceasefire along the Western Front organized by the French, British, and German soldiers. They crossed trenches to exchange food, souvenirs, and ideas. In some cases, they played soccer, sang Christmas carols, held burial ceremonies, and exchanged prisoners of war. The ceasefires were also held at various places in 1915. However, by 1916, the war had become more bitter and the officers in the French, British, and German armies squashed the ceasefires, killing was much more important than peacemaking. Paul Vaillant Couturier, his dates are 1892 to 1917, was one of the French soldiers among those who celebrated truce. As a young man from a well-to-do bourgeois family in Paris, he had never thought he would one day fight for France and killed Germans. His parents were successful singers and actors. And as he indicated in his fictional autobiography, he was groomed to become a professional lawyer or engineer. However, he followed in his parents' footsteps and became an artist, a writer, a poet. Yet after enlisting in the French army, and serving in the infantry and artillery during World War I, he came to realize how cruel war, war was and caused the deaths of thousands of young men who sacrificed their lives to protect the interests of the ruling classes. By the time he was dismissed in 1919, he emerged as a pacifist and socialist with five medals of honor for heroism.
from this point of his life, he went on to become a major journalist and politician. He was one of the founders of the French Communist Party and served as editor of the left-wing newspaper, L'Humanité. He died in 1937 due to wounds from an assassinate, assassination attempt by a right-winger French man. Concerned about the future of young people, Vaillant Couturier published numerous books about the war and one of his most significant works was Johnny Breadless or Jean Sampin. It describes a much different education than he had received for, than he had ever received. Johnny Breadless is an orphan and does not understand why and how his parents died in the war and why there is no help for him. It is only until he encounters an amazing, amazing magical rabbit who takes him on a trip to various parts of the France during World War I to make him understand what was going on and also to give him hope. It was not until this rabbit does that, that Johnny begins to grasp the true conditions that lead to the exploitation of common people and to wars that benefit the rich. It is in this remarkable fairy tale novel that a ceasefire takes place, one that gives Johnny hope that people can live together in peace. It's a truce that Vaillant Couturier waged for most of his life. And I'd like to show you some interesting, well, first of all, this is the cover of the book that I translated. And I want to show you some of the, the differences are interesting in terms of the illustrations. This is uh, for the 1934 sort of more loca illustrations are much different than in the original book where you have <laughs> a much different style in 1919. Now, I, I want to also introduce another book, and this is uh, the book Kiro, which was written and illustrated in 1939 by Deirdre and William Constelman and illustrated by Fred Fox. Uh, it was clearly intended to wake people up, remember 1939, before we entered the war, but the war had already started in Europe. It was clearly, clearly, intended to wake people up, young and old, to the dangers of fascism. Moreover, it is a story which reveals how fascists will defeat themselves. What is significant about the book are the striking pictures and the manner in which Kido causes his own death. The original publishers of this book wrote on the back cover, Kido arrived at our office today, late, Saturday, when we should have been playing golf. We never let it get out of our office until the contract was signed to publish it. And now here it is, the book for children from six to 60, a living proof that as long as Kido can be written and published, the world we know is safe. The Kidos, or we could say the Trumpists, will never conquer us no matter how many cannons and guns and submarines they use to murder us because we can laugh and they can't. And strange to say, our laughter will prove their undoing. So again, I want to show you some illustrations. Here's the, Kido is this guy right here. He looks like Hitler, but he wasn't. He was a young, always a, sort of a young boy, but he wants to kick the, uh, that's the world, and he wants to <laughs> kick the world out, but he himself is exposed through laughter. And he's trying to use his ears to protect 
the laughter that finally more or less rubs him out. So aside from the books I've already mentioned that, that I've published in Little Mole and Honey Bear, there are four other European and American authors whose tales I and thousands of scholars of the history of children's literature have somehow ignored. I didn't even include them in my two editions of the Oxford Companion to Fairy Tales. In other words, I had no idea how significant these writers and authors were. The writers are the Russian teacher and poet Pyotr Pavlovich Yershov uh, from the 19th century, the French politician and scholar of jurisprudence, Edouard Laboulay, also a 19th century writer and scholar, the American writer, Herminia, uh, I'm sorry, the Austrian writer, Herminia Zermühlen, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and she wrote most of her books in the 1920s and 30s in Germany. And finally, the American sort of crazy, amazing writer, Charles Godfrey Leland. All four were liberal thinkers and teachers who wrote fairy tales to express their political and moral sentiments and to reveal how tyrants and their cronies have manipulated chilled people to work against themselves so that they would be deprived of the benefits of their creative talents and labor. One of Laboulaye's tales, which is called Falsehood and Truth, which I published in, in a recent book called Sm uh, Smack Bam, or the, uh, uh, the Art of Governing Men, uh, demonstrates, this book was written about 1882, demonstrates just how relevant all the old stories still are and need uh, uh, an unburying. The story, Falsehood and Truth, is a kind of parable and particularly disturbing because it speaks so forthrightly to the conflicts of our times. In olden times, falsehood and truth resolved to live together like a pair of friends. Truth was a good person, simple, timid, and confident. Falsehood was a smooth talker, elegant, and daring. One commanded and the other always obeyed. Everything went well in such a friendly fashion. A Kanwa man, falsehood, convinces truth, a woman, to plant a tree with him for the benefit of the people. And then he pretends that she would be better protected by burrowing into the ground and looking after the roots of the tree beneath the ground while well, he would take on the dangerous task of protecting the branches from inclement weather, men, birds, and bees. Consequently, he takes credit for the beautiful flowering of the tree and tells the people who gather around the tree to admire it and preaches that he represents beauty and truth. He claims that society is filled with lies and that truth is falsehood. In fact, when a catastrophe occurs on earth, falsehood blames truth. And the people drive truth further underground and build a tomb over her hole so she cannot return to earth. Laboulay closes this tale by relating, to be sure, to be more sure of his victory Falsehood built himself a palace over the tomb, tomb of truth. But it is said sometimes she turns in her grave. When this happens, the palace crumbles like a house of cards and buries all the innocent and guilty people who have been living there. But the people have other things to do then mourn their dead. They continue to carry out their legacy. Those 
eternal dukes rebuild the palace each time more beautiful than the old ones and falsehood lame and squinting sometimes continues to reign there to his to this very day truth is what we realize we lack as we read Laboulaye's folk and fairy tales. It is the realization, it is the realization that daily appearances deceive us. And unless we pierce the spectacle of our lives, our lives will be determined for us by systems that do not enable possibilities for autonomous thinking and social justice. In all, <clears throat> excuse me, in all five historical cases of Behrman, Yashov, Labulai, Zormulin, and Lilan, there is a strong connection between their writing, anti-authoritarian fairy tales, <coughs> excuse me, about truth and their own efforts to live lives in truth. They, all of them, were powerless and yet opposed the powerful through their writing and actions. They spoke truth to the unjust. Their works are part of what many historians call the usable past. As Eric Foner has explained, and Foner is an American philosopher and a professor of political science. As Eric Foner has explained, and I'm quoting, history does not inform the present, and it should. That's what I mean by a usable past, a historical consciousness that can enable us to address the problems of society today in an intelligent manner, end of a quote. This is why I believe we should try to make folk and fairy tales of the past usable history <coughs> and to study them in light of their relevant socio-political context and truth value. Thank you. We do have uh, time uh, for questions. Uh, so uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A column at this point. Um, I will start, uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, you talk about your, your thesis uh, uh, about the power dynamics of uh, storytelling with regard to, to fairy tales. Uh, and that fairy tales uh, sometimes are more truthful than fact. Could you relate this thesis uh, to the to specific fairy tales that the audience might be familiar with, if you could flesh out your your points sure. in the sure in context. <laughs> For instance, uh, nobody uh, likes to talk about child abuse or or uh, the abandoning abandonment of children, uh, and and how how perverse. Uh, our society is with regard and hypocritical when it comes to educating them. Uh, and the Hansel and Gretel for, is, a, is an example of, of, of showing, demonstrating to what extent uh, we, uh, we do this. And uh, although it has a happy ending, we don't know what's going to happen really uh, with a father who already abandoned and they bring back money to him. Uh, so it's an interesting tale because it confronts us, it makes us think about uh, a contemporary problems uh, that we have in all over the world. Uh, the treatment of children is uh, ridiculously bad and terrible and uh, we need something somehow to resolve this conflict so that Hansel and Gretel is almost like a mimetic fairy tale that is it spreads all the we we there's everybody in the world practically knows that tale and the reason they know it is because we 
as uh, human beings have not resolved this terrible problem of child abandonment and uh, child exploitation. Um, another questioner uh, asks, uh, says, I am a family historian. How do family stories relate to fairy tales? <laughs> well, my father used to tell me all sorts of tales about Russia and, <clears throat> and how he used to fight the polar bears to get to school every day. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and as a young boy, of course, I thought that he grew, had grown up in Russia. Actually, he was born uh, a, a day or two after my grandparents arrived in America, in New York, about 1910 or so. And, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't only later uh, that I realized it was a type of folk tale, fairy tale that my father used to love to tell, and many more. Uh, so family, I think it's uh, really brings uh, family members together if they tell tales, and even if they embroider them or they are, are let us say, uh, not in quotes truthful the way we think of, of uh, a tale should be, or, or realistic tale. Uh, so fairy, uh, family stories uh, can, rain, uh, can range from being very truthful, very factual, uh, to uh, imaginative uh, stories that make us laugh, bring us together, and uh, give us a feeling of community. Okay, a question. Uh, do children's stories from uh, non-European cultures, uh, African, Asian, Indigenous, etc., have similar themes uh, as uh, European stories? And if they differ, how do they differ? Yeah, yes, they, they naturally, they have different belief systems uh, uh, and uh, uh, different beliefs, actually. Uh, but uh, they are very similar. That's the amazing thing about folk and fairy tales is that you can find uh, versions of Little Red Riding Hood in China, in Japan, in Australia, <laughs> New Zealand, you name it. And mm -hmm. most of the uh, more significant tales from the Brothers Grimm collection, and the Brothers Grimm, of course, were they were recording tales that had already been told uh, uh, 200, 300, 400 years before they began collecting their tales. So um, yes, uh, the, we have common problems. As we speak, for instance, like take Little Red Riding Hood, which is a tale about rape, rape or violation of women. Uh, this particular, uh, and uh, we have to know, or we do know that uh, almost every four minutes, some woman, or young woman or girl is being violated in, in the world. And one of the reasons we retell or, re, or Little Red Riding Hood, we retell in many different ways, uh, you know, through films, through opera, through storytelling, through print and so on and so forth. The, this, this particular tale is a tale that helps us think about, uh, and it's varied to a great extent, but it helps us think about why and how women continue to be violated today. All right, um, a next questioner says, what do you, this isn't strictly fairy tales, but it's related. I know why he's asking this question, he or she. Uh, what do you think about the Dr. Seuss organization's announcement today that they will cease to publish some of his books because of their, um, uh, racist or, or um, stereotypical portrayals of certain people. Yeah, uh, well, for, I haven't written about Dr. Seuss, but I've read most of his books or a good many of his books. And he was extremely political in the 1930s. And really uh, a lot of his books smashed or undid uh, a lot of censorship that existed during that time. So. Uh, that's about all I can really say. I'm surprised um, um, that he is being called a racist because uh, from what I know, he, he, simply, he was a very liberal leaning 
uh, writer and illustrator. I myself have faced a similar, a problem that uh, where political correctness sometimes can go a bit too far. Uh, there's a book that I'd like to publish from the uh, 1940s, and it's all about uh, uh, it, it's it's all about a, uh, a, a an animal that uh, is I, I, uh, I'm trying to remember with, uh, a raccoon, right? Uh, all about a, a family of raccoons, and the youngest turns out to be uh, more uh, uh, dark and black than the others who are more brown, light brown, or or, or some other color, and um, and the and the story which was written uh, during and illustrated uh, during the nineteen forties um, uh, uh, is sort of uh, I, I would say somewhat uh, on the borderline of being racist. But uh, it, we have to remember that this is the 1940s, way before there was a real move to do away with the type of racism where, which has always been there. But uh, it was actually this artist, Dorothy Burroughs, made a major attempt to show that one should be proud of being black. <laughs> and, but uh, she calls this a particular animal nigger or ni niger. And of course, a lot of my friends said, you can't ever publish a book, for, even though it may have a good message. And so I, I'm not publishing it, but I feel somewhat at a loss because here's a writer who is definitely left wing, who definitely did other books that, I've, that I'm publishing, and yet wrote this one book where she was trying to confront racism, and yet it was an awkward, written in a very awkward way. So uh, that may be the case also with the Dr. Zeus books. I'm not too sure, I haven't read them. Okay, um, I'm gonna answer a, a number of questions that have come up. A number of people asked, uh, could they get a written copy of your bibliography? Uh, you, not, you mentioned a number of uh, names. Rather than put those names in the chat column, because there were quite a few, I, am I have Professor Zipe's bibliography, and I'm going to distribute it to the uh, registered uh, uh, you know, auditors of this class. So don't worry about that question. If there's several people who put it in the Q&A column, I will send you the bibliography after the talk. Um, okay, uh, all right, the next question. I'm not, I, I don't quite understand this question. And so I'm gonna read it. And I think perhaps you will be able to answer it better than I can uh, make it clear. Uh, in my reading. Uh, the question is, how can fairy tales show that falsehood and those like him has different values with the result that common ground between falsehood and those living in truth is virtually impossible? Uh, I'm not too sure of the question, okay. <laughs> but, but uh, basically, uh, uh, I, I think what what the that particular story is showing uh, is that uh, we live at a time when people are not willing uh, to confront uh, and uh, to confront the differences and to try to uh, expose falsehood for what it is, and if not convert falsehood to also to so that falsehood or that person or whatever is uh, using false information uh, so that they might convert. Uh, I, I think that a lot of the writers that, that I'm publishing and my own position is that uh, uh, there is no means thus far to, and, and we see that in America today, uh, there is really uh, no way that truth can make any compromises to convert people who still who strongly believe in misinformation, and we see that, and it's a it's a dilemma, 
And uh, I think a lot of the fairy tales that I'm publishing are going to address that in the future. All right. Um, another questioner wants to know uh, the items, uh, I believe the items that, that you yourself are publishing, uh, where can one buy those? So, um, where can we get access to these items? Oh, well, Majors and Quinn in, in Minneapolis mm -hmm. uh, and some other bookstores, I think, uh, uh, okay. Barnes and Noble. Uh, but the uh, uh, the distributor is a, a local distributor, Itasca, I-T-A-S-C-A, and they're wonderful. You, you can go on the website of Itasca and they and order the book through I, books through Itasca. I've got about four or five books okay. there. And then the other place, of course, is Amazon. All my books, I've five or well, I've got tons of books <laughs> there. But okay. uh, all the books I mentioned are there. Sure. So in, in other words, they're widely available. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, this questioner wants to know, are there examples of your uh, positions, examples from Africa and Asia that you can talk about? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's amazing, uh, there are amazing anthologies of African folk tales and fairy tales and legends and animal stories and so on. So it would be, it would take me an hour to sort of provide you with a bibliography. But all, all you have to do, I think, is uh, again, go on a website or go on the internet. Uh, and there, there are remarkable African uh, tales uh, that uh, people, a lot of people know and use. How successful have fairy tale authors been in exposing political truths without the leaders or the systems being depicted without them realizing that they were the targets and <laughs> thus subjecting the author to persecution or imprisonment or worse? <laughs> yeah, there were uh, many uh, in, in the Soviet Union uh, when uh, in the 1920s before Stalin came to power, uh, the, uh, a lot of Russian authors and illustrators uh, uh, really challenged uh, any type of, of auto, uh, autocracy or any type of, of injustice and so on and so forth. And th there are wonderful, excellent Russian books uh, and from the 1920s and 1930s in which uh, the uh, authors and artists uh, uh, implicated uh, the ruling powers, in particular Stalin. And, uh, and of course, uh, even today, there are a lot of political uh, caricaturists uh, who uh, do a great job of uh, exposing uh, the fallacies and the uh, misinformation and untruths of the ruling, ruling government. Uh, one of the, uh, unfortunately, one of the books I, I've recently published, probably one of my favorites, is called Yusuf the uh, Ostrich, and it's written written and illustrated uh, by um, um, a, a wonderful uh, a, a, a wonderful Hungarian uh, writer uh, called Kellen, uh, K E L E N, and uh, he came. Uh, he was Jewish, uh, Hungarian Jewish. He was he was a a political cartoonist for the. Uh, uh, the nations, uh, the what is a group called? Not the United Nations, but in the 1930s. The League of Nations. League of Nations, I'm sorry. And uh, he fled in 1938 and came here and he illustrated in the 1940s some wonderful books. And one of the, the one I published is called Yusuf the Ostrich, about this ostrich when after he's born, uh, an, an Arab, Arab boy really befriends him and uh, he wants to go to school with the boy, the Arab boy, and he does go to school and he learns how to read and write and speak. And the allies in 1940, uh, remember, occupied Northern Africa. And at one point, uh, they need a messenger. And because Yusuf can run so fast as an ostrich, 
he serves the American army uh, until he's captured. And, and then he's captured. And when he's captured, this fat Nazi <laughs> orders uh, him to be killed. But then two little Dachshunds save his life, <laughs> free him, and he runs back to uh, the force, American forces with a lot of information and uh, they all want to make a hero out of him. But he says, no, I just want to see my mother again and love her. And it's a wonderful, amazing illustrations and so on. Uh, I don't have a didn't have a copy here, but that's that's probably one of the books I would recommend anyone interested in the type of uh, not actually radical children's literature, but literature that really deals with history and deals with the problems that we are having in the world. And I did put that title and author in the chat column. Oh, um, thank you. Sure. Yeah, his first uh, name is Emer Emery Kellen. K -E -L -E yeah. 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 I, I took it from your manuscript, so I've got <laughs> it in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, our grandchildren watch Disney movies. Oh. Are you familiar with films like Soul? And are there redeeming qualities that come from these films? Well, I, I've written a, a, a huge book called The Enchanted Screen. I'm not a fan of Disney. And, uh, and when we talk about Disney, we have to make distinctions. Walt Disney, you know, uh, lived until the, about the 1960s. And his major works were done in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and then we have the corporation, uh, which uh, he founded more or less. Uh, nevertheless, whether it's the corporation or Walt Disney, the person, I am very critical of the uh, uh, racism, uh, uh, authoritarianism, and also sexism in the Disney films. And I, I don't recommend, rec I don't uh, recommend them to anyone, but I'm not, uh, uh, this is such a huge corporation today. There may be some decent films published by the Disney Corporation, but basically when you have a, uh, an organization uh, like Disney with billions and billions of dollars, the major in, in our capitalist society, the ma major effort on the part of Disney is to use art to make money. <laughs> and to use art to make money for me is, I think, uh, uh, really disgraceful. And so for me, the way the Disney Corporation has used fairy tales is disgraceful because of the fact that most of the major fil films they made, such as not, not just fairy tale films, but even Bambi, the f uh, Bambi film is one of the most atrocious uh, films I've ever seen when it comes to women, when it comes to uh, understanding animals and the plight of animals and so on and so forth. So I'm very critical of, the, of any Disney uh, product. I, I get the racism and sexism uh, is shown by Disney films, but could you talk a little bit, what are some instances of authoritarianism in Disney films? Uh, what is the, the, the film, oh, I'm forgetting the titles, The Lion King. Uh -huh. The Lion okay. King is all about celebrating, okay. uh, uh, celebrating a king. Who wants to celebrate a king? What has a king <laughs> done for us except uh, exploit us? You know, uh, I'm right. even frozen. Who cares about two princesses who have it good in their pet? And uh, th that's all about uh, why should we be dragged into stories? Though those poor, poor girls, you know, they, they don't have the millions of dollars with they don't have this or that. I don't care about Frozen at all. But aren't princesses and kings and queens not, uh, aren't they a fixture of fairy tales in general? They're not just a, a Disney manifestation, right? Right, you're exactly, exactly right. I mean, there are many kings and queens in fairy tales and some of them, some of these kings and queens are generous, uh, thank God, uh, or, uh, uh, they are cruel and uh, a lot of queens and princesses, you know, and the, but, but most of the Grimm's tales or Anderson are now, uh, we, we have a misconception 
about what fairy tales are. They don't deal, first of all, most of the tales are not about fairies. There are very <laughs> few fairies in fairy tales. And, and, and then what is fascinating is that uh, the, most of the best fairy tales don't have uh, princes and kings and princesses and so on. If you read all the close to 350 tales in the Brothers Grimm or Anderson's tales, or there are other anthologies, uh, they deal with the common people and what peasants and what difficulties they have. The, the fact is, the reason why we all talk about Disney or kings and queens and so on is because culture is controlled by very rich elite groups and they want their stories. They, they, they are not our stories, they are their stories. Okay, okay. And, and I think this next question is also related. Um, the question is, are, aren't most of European fairy tales based in Christianity? No, <laughs> and not in a million years. They were all secular. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, the written fairy tales, the superb written fairy tales in the 1690s by about 10 different arist aristocratic French women, they hated the church. And, and, there's not, and, and instead of, they are responsible for championing women fairies. They, they rebelled against Louis the 14th and the church and there's not and in their tales the fairies are omnipotent they are like they are like the powers of God they, they do things that God normally does so uh, and that tradition is clear in uh, the, these literary tales emanated from the folk from the common people and uh, so uh, fairy tales, have no, uh, uh, the church, all churches uh, rebel against the secular fairy tales. They won't recognize them. And so fairy tale tellers and fairy tale writers won't recognize the church. <laughs> That's what you have, that situation. Okay. All right. Okay, and the next question is something of a frontal attack. She <laughs> Verson says, these stories did not prevent tyranny and war or the power of the self-serving to control the common narrative. So why study them? <laughs> so there uh, you go, justify your life's work. No, that's, no. <laughs> no absolutely right. Uh, fairy tales are not the medicine. They're not the medicine. They're the, they analyze, okay? We read fairy tales, one, sometimes for escapism, sometimes for just pleasure, sometimes to learn something and so on and so forth. And they are remarkable. Why, why, is, why are fairy tales, what, what we call fairy tales, uh, the most popular genre in the world? Uh, and there are many different ones, many different ways that fairy tales have been recreated, uh, uh, either sometimes taking the old fairy tales or sometimes not, or creating new fairy tales. Fairy tale operas, fairy tale films, fairy tale, uh, podcast, fairy tale this, fairy tale that, and so what is going on here? That's why we should study fairy tales because they they are part and parcel of all cultures throughout the world. Stories have truth in them, and it's up to us to try to study them to find the truths so that we understand ourselves and our situation in life much better than we actually do. They do help us, but they're not the medicine. Okay. Um, the next question, I think, relates uh, to your answer. The question uh, concerns um, uh, the ideal of archetypes uh, as found in, in Carl Jung's work. Uh, could you e explain a little bit, first of all, what archetypes are and then how that relates to fairy tales? Okay, there's no such thing as an archetype. Carl Jung's works you should burn. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for burning books. So uh, call, I don't know, throw in a waste paper but, basket. But could you it. explain what Carl Jung uh, he proposed? Believed that, that we, in the unconscious, uh, he believed in the collective unconscious, that we all have the same collective unconscious, that there are types in our brains that called archetypes 
that uh, help us, uh, <clears throat> that enable us to really deal with con personal conflicts that we have. And these archetypes, uh, like a, 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 in particular, a lot of them are feminine archetypes or uh, sometimes other male archetypes that will uh, help us if we can recognize ourselves in them, in, their, in the collective unconscious, we can uh, sort of resolve our neuroses. <laughs> and, and now tell us uh, why you should throw that idea out. Why is that because, a discredited because idea? Because neuro neuroscientists uh, have not, have, have uh, and also Freud, by the way, I, I dislike Carl Jung, who was a fascist, much more than I do <laughs> Freud. Uh, but the, uh, today, psychiatry and psychology have come a long way. And though there's some important things that in particular Freud discovered, not, not, uh, not Jung, uh, that we should keep, you know, again, we, uh, we come back to the no this notion that history is very useful if we go back and study it so that we have a clear understanding of the present. And it's discovered that everything that Carl Jung has written is, is false. There's no, no truth, to, no understanding, no basis, no scientific basis to anything he wrote. He was a little mad at the end of his life. Plus the fact he was a fascist. Now I'm not going to recommend him to anybody in particular because there's nothing to what he wrote. And if you follow, if all the Jungians follow his readings and so on and his notions, they're going to destroy a lot of lives <laughs> because okay. they use Jungian principles as the basis of their, of their so-called helpful psychology. And uh, so uh, when it comes to Freud, the same thing is true. I mean, his notion of hysteria and it was so, fe so, so sexist in, in the late, eight, I think it was 1890s or the beginning of the 20th century is a horrible book. And I love, uh, uh, many other things that Freud wrote are, are totally misleading when it comes to a scientific understanding of how the brain works or how we function uh, emotionally. So th there are today many other uh, writers, psychiatrists or, or scholars of psychology or psychiatry who are much more important to read than either Jung or Freud. And it's, it's horrible to see the types of analyses of uh, fairy tales and folk tales by Jungians and Freudians, they're way off target. I began, in fact, my own studies, uh, or my first book, or my third book, I would say, deals with Bruno Bettelheim, who's also a follower of Freud and wrote a book about fairy tales, which is a disaster. Okay. All right, what about uh, Joseph Campbell? This person wants to know. Oh, oh God, he's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't bother dealing with Joseph okay, Campbell. Okay, you don't like him either. <laughs> All right. No. Okay, another question though, and I apologize, we're running out of time, so I'm no afraid problem. I'm not going to get to everyone's question, but I'm going to try and barrel through as many as possible. <laughs> Um, what would you say about the, the sort of constructed fairy tale, the one, the, the non-folk fairy tale? This person cites the story of the Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. Yes. But there are other fairy tales with defined authors. And, yes. Uh, what can you yes. say about those? Yes, oh, oh, definitely. Oscar Wilde's a brilliant writer and, uh, and wrote, you know, two books, two fairy tale books. And uh, and, but, you know, when people learn to write, we have to go back again to the uh, sort of the 15th or 14th century. Uh, it's, uh, then there, we have this parallel development. We have the oral development of folk and fairy tales and, and magic. Um, I mean, basically, a uh, simple definition of a fairy tale is a, a story with magical transformation. Simple, okay? So there are many ways you can talk about transformations and magic in 
writing and also in speaking and talking. So uh, the basically uh, the uh, development of the fairy tale. Uh, I'm losing. Uh, I, uh, uh, can you give me the question again? I've lost my. I've lost my question. Oh, just uh, to comment on on fairy tales that are constructed. Fairy tales oh, like right. the Happy Prince right. 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 Oscar Wilde. Created, yeah, create, yeah. yeah. They're, they're quite often brilliant uh, because people. Uh, educated people who have uh, experienced, uh, who, who have been, who learn how to write and want to be poets or singers or storytellers or whatever, they'll use the pen or whatever to uh, create stories to resolve their own psychological problems, their own, uh, pro the problems they may have with families and so on. Uh, or they write these stories to celebrate uh, uh, to, or to help people understand the world. Uh, so these construct, so-called constructed stories are what we call literary fairy tales. And they mm. involve uh, uh, writing. They involve educated people who know how to write and know how to uh, communicate, know how to uh, s present or demonstrate what is happening in the world. And so we do have you know, writers like uh, Hans Christian Andersen or E.T.A. E. Hoffmann and, you know, up to the present, we have brilliant writers like Philip Pullman in, in England uh, and many other, uh, you know, writers throughout the world. Almost every country today uh, has a tradition of literary and oral fairy tales. And that leads to the next question. Uh, do children still hear fairy tales beyond Disney? Are there contemporary fairy tales? And I think oh, you mentioned oh. Philip Pullman, but maybe you'd like to yeah. talk about some, and someone else. Yeah, there are tons of <laughs> today, good and bad writers of fairy tales. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the market uh, for fairy tales uh, is very strong. I mean, parents think that uh, their ch children should begin life with fairy tales. So uh, they, uh, uh, I would say, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the different approaches uh, to these tales. The more imaginative, the more they break away from the sort of stereotypical fairy tale, uh, the better. And uh, the in terms of films, anybody who knows anything about fairy tales uh, uh, knows that Miyazaki, the great Japanese uh, filmmaker, is 10 times, 10 times, 1,000 times better than any film that the fairy, the uh, Disney uh, uh, has produced. And there's an Irish group that, that produced about three different uh, amazing animated films. I mean, there are, you have to look because of the fact that uh, the Disney Corporation has prevent, actually prevented some producers or films from being shown in America because they would challenge sort of the king of all fairy tales, Disney. Uh, and, and so we have to, we, you do have to look for these amazing fairy tale films that are out there, uh, made throughout the world. And uh, they are, I would say, much more interesting than the traditional Disney film. I'm sorry to say that we're out of time, but uh, because I know there are perhaps Miyazaki fans out there or people who would <laughs> like to be Miyazaki fans, could you say the name of the, the famous, uh, is it Princess Mononoke? Uh, yes. Mia, yes. Okay, I'm gonna put that in the chat column um, just in case anyone's interested. Um, Mononoke, ah, okay. Um, all right, we are out of time. I'm afraid we're beyond our time. And I do apologize to anyone whose question I did not get a chance to ask. Thank you uh, very much, um, Professor Jack Sipes, for this uh, interesting talk on fairy tales and their relationship to our lives and history. Please come back, our audience, um, next week, January, or excuse me, um, next, Mar next Tuesday, March 9th. We will welcome Star Tribune writer Kurt Brown 
on Minnesota 1918, the previous plague. You think we've got it bad during COVID? Well, we do, but we also had it bad uh, 100 plus years ago. And uh, Kurt Brown will tell us about the uh, influenza pandemic of 1918. But for today, I'm going to say goodbye and uh, thank you very much to everyone involved. Bye-bye. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.